for that intro, Jen. Thanks for thanks for everyone for showing up. It's great to be here. Uh, I just want to confirm: Are you seeing my presentation? Yes. All right, fantastic. Um, so this is me, Jim Callback. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Callback. I'm the head of customer success at Mural. If you don't know Mural, it's an online whiteboard. It's a virtual whiteboard that you can access through your browser. So it's great for UX design with remote teams. And I am the author of Mapping Experiences. That's the latest book that I wrote. Uh, just came out uh, last year. <clears throat> Uh, I have some links and things that I'll send around uh, after the presentation in the Slack channel, but I'll uh, get right into my presentation. <clears throat> uh, I'm kind of I'm really glad that uh, that Eli went uh, before me talking about some of the some of the be benefits and the sustainable uh, aspects around remote work. What I'm going to do is actually talk about remote. I'll talk about some of the benefits, but I wanted to talk about remote work and kind of capitalizing on those benefits because a lot of people struggle with remote work. Um, so I kind of wanted to frame it um, that way. How do we make remote work work? Um, and I wanted to start with a quote from Henry Ford. He wrote, um, or he said one time, this was around the turn of the last century, why is it every time I ask uh, for a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? And at the time, work meant going to a place. You were a factory worker. Only very few people were managers. Um, and, the, and the leaders and the, and the business leaders of a company, most, of the, most people were workers and they worked with their hands. We talk about a hired hand, right? Uh, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you used to hire somebody for their uh, manual labor. Um, but around 1950 uh, or so, um, <clears throat> Peter Drucker, for one, uh, recognized a shift. Um, and Peter Drucker, the father of modern management, coined the term knowledge worker. Um, and he wrote, um, of the 21st century, this was around 1950 or 60, he wrote, the most valuable asset in the 21st century institution will be its knowledge workers and their productivity. So there was a shift from working with your hands to working with information or working with your brains. And you, you were hired by what you know, not how strong you were, what you could do with your hands. And of course, then, um, you know, once everything, once we're talking about work being in, uh, information, working with information, the knowledge worker, and we connect each other and everything's digital, the, the concept of remote work um, is now a reality. Um, and here are just some signs of kind of the uptick of remote work. Um, we've seen in the past five or so years um, a focus on remote work in magazines, websites where you can find remote jobs, full-length books on the topic, people starting to talk more and more about remote work. Um, so this is this is our reality of of our organizations these days, uh, and I have a little bit more on that from a survey that we once did. And there are lots of benefits of this, and Eli hit on some of these in different ways. There's flexibilities with your schedule, being able to you know spend different uh, times of the day with your family and things like that. Uh, cost costs less. Uh, companies are reducing their uh, their real estate footprint by having fewer offices and things like that. There's actually studies that show that. Um, talent pools, and of course the big, uh, you know, reduced commute time, and it's not just commute time, it's the amount of cars and pollution. Um, Eli gave some nice statistics there on the amount of carbon um, that you might produce from commuting to work, and I know, uh, you know, Americans spend an awful lot of time in their cars. It's unhealthy, uh, not only for themselves physically, but it's unhealthy for the environment. Um, so there, there are lots of benefits that people, this is just some of them, but there are lots of benefits that people have um, identified around remote work in general. Um, and a lot of those um, can be traced back to uh, themes and topics in sustainability in general. And again, Eli highlighted some of those. Of course, there are disadvantages of remote work, isolation, lack of routine. Uh, communication and uh, natural communication is a lot harder. You're missing that social aspect. And then, of course, then we're, we're dependent on our technologies. We may be less dependent on our cars and things like that, but now we're very dependent on technology. And that brings its own challenges and struggles as well, too. Um, so what I kind of wanted to talk about, again, is um, not necessarily the sustainable aspects of remote work, but in order for remote work to actually have an impact on sustainability, on the environment, on our own personal health, um, and, and things like that, we have to make remote work work for us. Um, and I think, there are, um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions 
and myths around remote work. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on here in the body of my presentation. Some, some of the myths that I've seen or noticed and um, studied myself around remote work. The first one is remote work is new. I just mentioned in the past five years there's been an uptick in remote work. But actually, remote work goes back um, much further. Um, and by the way, when I say remote work, I'm not talking about taking your work somewhere and working on it by yourself. I'm talking really about remote collaboration. So the, the idea of working in a team or working with a company that is distributed, um, that's what I mean here in this presentation when I say remote work. You think about remote collaboration. But actually, remote collaboration um, isn't, isn't new. It, they, uh, there, there's been some experiments and examples from the late 60s. But I think uh, a landmark um, study is this one here. This is the title of a book called The Telecommunications Transportation Trade-Off by Jack Niles. And he actually coined the term telecommuting. So telecommuting comes from Jack Niles. And this was in 1973. He wrote this study then in, as a book, in a book in 1976. But he was specifically looking at the trade-off between costs of commuting physically with your car um, and, and you know, moving from point A to point B um, versus telecommuting. Um, and it's it's a very, very in-depth study going back to 1976. So in 1976, we had people starting to think about what are the potential sustainable sustainability aspects of telecommuting. Um, and he, fi he finds, I mean, it's hard to summarize a book in one word, but he basically finds, yes, there are potential benefits there. And there, the trade-off does favor um, for things like cost and pollution and things like that. It does favor telecommunications. But I think we've, uh, we've struggled with a lot of those things that I pointed out as well, too. Communication, technology, isolation, and things like that. So in order, f in order for us to kind of realize these benefits, I think we need to, we need to make remote collaboration work in lots of different ways. Um, and that's that's what I wanted to continue talking about. But the first the first idea that you know remote work is new um, is 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 a myth that goes back forty years or more, actually. Um, the next uh, point I wanted to make is that remote work means being far away. Um, we think about remote work or distributed team, you know, working on you know the East Coast and the West Coast in the U.S. or even across continents. I happen to be actually traveling right now, and I'm in Germany. So we're, I'm broadcasting here from Karlsruhe, Germany. Um, and, you know, you think about remote work, you know, across time zones or continents or even oceans or things like that. But that's not necessarily true. We actually do remote work pretty much all the time. Anytime we're um, mediating our communication, our collaboration through a computer, you can consider that re remote work. Um, and a, a professor at MIT, um, uh, Professor Allen, Allen is his last name, came up with uh, this curve called the Allen curve uh, from some studies of collaboration in an office space. Basically what he found is that frequency of communication drops with distance. Um, so that when you're about 71 meters away or about 200 feet away from your colleagues, the frequency of communication with that person or the patterns of communication are uh, near equivalent to uh, being in a, in a separate location, being, being separated by time zones or an ocean or something like that. So I um, mean, you think about it, if you work in a large office or in a campus maybe, you have multiple buildings in your company. Um, or floors, you're, you're, you're working with colleagues who are a floor or two above you, you may chat them on Slack or send an email or even join a, you know, a common uh, Skype call or something um, rather than getting together. Um, that's all remote work. Um, and I think we've all done that. Um, so, the, so the Allen curve, what the Allen curve shows us is that um, w working remotely or collaborating through your computer is actually something we do quite frequently, uh, and we're motivated to do that when the distance is still even short, even just ac across the room or uh, in the other uh, floor of your building. Um, so what, that, what this really means is that presence matters. And I think when we think about remote collaboration, um, the idea of, of being present, and uh, you know, that manifests its way in lots of different ways. The, the, little green, uh, the little green circle on Slack or on Skype showing that you're there, but also you know, answering quickly and communicating and engaging with your colleagues if you're remote. But presence really does matter um, in remote collaboration. Um, here is an, an example of the double robotics um, uh, remote uh, robot where you can actually drive in a, in a remote office. You can actually drive around as an iPad or a tablet device and um, you know, move over to your colleagues 
as if you were there. But you have a presence in the in the office then uh, through through this kind of uh, technology. So technology is changing, but I think our habits and our behaviors also needs to change. Need to change. I think the the point to remember is that presence matters, and when you're collaborating, just be being available and showing that you're there is important to make remote work successful. Um, the next. Uh, point uh, myth that I want to talk about it is the idea of remote work being permanent. Uh, I've worked remote uh, or from a home office, I should say, for much of my career, at least for the past 15 years in different jobs and with different companies. Um, and uh, I was, uh, you know, separated from my office, but I would travel, um, right? So it wasn't uh, um, all the time that I was out of the office or away from my colleagues face to face. So the idea that remote work um, is permanent is also not true. We, we, we do get together and, and see each other face to face, even if we're working on different coasts and things like that. Or even if you, um, you know, take the Friday off or, or work from a Starbucks, um, you can consider that remote work, um, but it may not be permanent. Um, so we move in and out of remote work. Um, again, whether it's what just communicating with your colleague on the next floor or going to a Starbucks for an afternoon or if you are physically distributed um, you know that those that situation changes as well too so remote work isn't necessarily a permanent condition um, and the, uh, the fourth myth uh, that I that I want to point to is that remote work is up to the remote person um, particularly when you have a central office a headquarters of, of kinds um, it, you may be tempted to uh, you know, set up a meeting where you have a conference room and there's a group of people there in the conference room. Their communication patterns are going to be a lot more fluid and quicker than the communication with the remote person. So te what you tend to get is this here and there type of situation where the, the people in the office are here and the people who are on a conference call are there. Um, and it's it's kind of the up to the remote person. Well, they're remote, so they have to figure out how to you know butt in and ask a question or help make a decision. Uh, or the one that I love is when you draw on the whiteboard and then you you actually say to the person on the phone, "You can't see this." Um, I think it's actually up to everybody. If one person in a group is remote, the whole team is remote. So that's a, again a behavioral thing, and you might notice a lot of these um, a lot of these myths kind of point to behaviors, not technology. I I personally don't think the problem with remote work is technology. I think it's behaviors and it's attitude, and that's why I want to expose these myths. Here's a picture of a you know a design workshop. Let's say um, these people are going to be able to collaborate at a different pace and in a different way than somebody on the phone. If you had a star phone there on that table, um, uh, that the people listening and trying to participate in this conversation are going to have a, a, a different uh, experience and a more difficult time. But I contend it's up to everybody um, to think about how the remote collaboration is going and whether that's a healthy collaboration and a balanced co collaboration or not. So it's up to all of us, I think, regardless if we're face-to-face -face or not, to think about remote collaboration. Um, and then finally, you can work from anywhere. Um, you hear that a lot, too. Um, might be kind of true, and I know things like co-working spaces are um, are cropping up. Um, so you, you can you can work from different cities, and those are also, by the way, very efficient. You get um, a high use of workspace, a high use of things like your internet connection and, and uh, electricity and things like that. So co-working spaces, I think, in general, um, are a sustainable move. Um, and the digital nomads, as they're so called, can work uh, from anywhere. But it, it's really um, when we're talking about you know work, you know business collaboration. I think you do need to think about your environment uh, in lots of respects: background noise, um, whether you can concentrate or not, focus, and things like that. Um, or, or the favorite, my favorite one is you know working from the beach. Um, right? Um, we always have this romantic notion of working from the beach, but if you've ever taken your computer even just out in the sun in your backyard, you know you can't see it. So people aren't working from the beach in those pictures that you see. Um, but re with remote UX, I think, it's, I think it's different. It's different than just doing a conference call and listening to people's voices because when you talk about UX and design, um, you know, it's visual. Um, we have to diverge. It's not linear, in other words. You don't you don't go through bullet points one by one. You're trying to explore a problem space. You don't know where it's going to take you, and that's hard to do through a Skype call or remote sometimes. And it's also iterative. 
right? Very often remote work tends to be scheduled and you don't have that spontaneous, um, you know, ability to just think uh, through ideas and come back to them in an iterative way. So I think one of the challenges when we talk about remote work and we then talk about remote design, I think remote design is where we particularly need better skills. Again, if, if we can make remote design function and work for us, then we can uh, gain the benefits that remote work has that um, I, I pointed out and Eli pointed out as well too. Um, so to better understand this, uh, my company, Mural, we did a survey at the end of, this was at the end of 2015. We have one going now that we should have ended in December, but it's still open. I'll give you the uh, the URL for that actually. But we, uh, we, um, <clears throat> We uh, surveyed 275 designers from around the world, mostly digital product designers. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of the, hi the highlights from the survey that we did in at the end of 2015. And then I'll give you the URL where you can take uh, last year's survey. It's still open for, um, I actually kept it open for this event if anybody wanted to take it. But what we what we found is that pretty much everybody's working remote at some point in time. So the frequency of remote work was one of the questions that we asked. And over two-thirds of the people are doing it all the time or most of the time. Um, um, so it's only, only a few people that say sometimes or never, actually. So remote design, and this is specifically asking about remote design, asking designers about trying to design with a remote team, it's very prevalent. I actually stopped asking this question, you know, do you work remote, and, and ask people, how do you work remote? How do you get by as a designer? Here, here's the one, though, that was troubling. This was from 2015. We asked, does the quality of your design work go up or down with, remote, uh, with a remote condition? Um, and about half of the people said it's actually worse or much worse. So I think that's the problem. And this is kind of the point of my presentation is that we're in these situations where our companies are distributed, our teams are distributed, and we're expected to perform, but we feel that the quality of our work suffers. So in order to, for us as designers to, to function better, and then again, um, kind of by association, uh, reap the benefits of a more su sustainable, balanced work life, um, I think we need to make remote design work for us better. Let me get rid of this guy here. Um, so here's the survey. If you want to take this year's, this year being 2016, uh, you could go to bit.ly slash remote collaboration. It's bit.ly slash remote collaboration. I'll show this at the end of the presentation and we can pass these links around too uh, in the Slack. I'm also making this presentation available on SlideShare. It's up there already. If you go to the Mural SlideShare um, uh, account, it's M-U-R-A-L, uh, on SlideShare, you'll find this presentation with these links in there. Um, I just want to give a quick example. Um, we work with uh, Intuit. <clears throat> big tax software company in uh, in the US um, and we, we, we did a, a study a little a little case study where we were working with a team of participants one in California and another group of people in the Philippines and we were using our laptops um, mural the, the our online whiteboard kind of served as a platform we were doing a service blueprint uh, exercise uh, and we had uh, uh, iPads and laptops and uh, you know obviously a webcam and we had the conference call going with the group in the Philippines but uh, on the right of this image you'll see the Microsoft Surface Hub and this is a large 84 inch touchscreen TV with high resolution and high touch uh, sensitivity and we were actually uh, at times with this this picture in this particular picture we happen to all have been sitting down but we we stood up and we we facilitated from the the touchscreen uh, and this is all cloud based so mural is a cloud based application and anything anyone added on any of their devices got added to the mural to the whiteboard and it, it was immediately visible to anybody else uh, whether they were in California or in the Philippines um, so it was a very interesting ex experiment to see if we could do a, a full service blueprinting exercise without using a sticky note the sticky notes you see in the background on the wall there from a completely different project but we successfully did it not only that um, it was quicker and when we got done, we didn't have to take pictures of the of the whiteboard and send them send them around as JPEGs that nobody can read or type them up. Spent a lot of my career typing up sticky notes. Um, you know, so the state of state of the art technology for for design in the 21st century is sticky notes and butcher paper, um, and that's great. But that assumes you're going to be face to face. So I think when we talk about remote work as being um, something that can help sustainability, we need to make remote collaboration, in particular remote design, we need to make that really work for us. 
Um, that's what we're committed to do at Mural, actually. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you this. Um, I wanted to see if I could show uh, the mural. <clears throat> so I should be sharing. I should be sharing the mural that we worked on in that workshop that I was talking about. And you'll see here, uh, mural is a. It's an online whiteboard that you can zoom in and out of. Uh, and we were doing this uh, service blueprinting uh, exercise here. Let me just zoom in on this. So you can see you can zoom in, kind of like Google Maps. But we created the map. Um, and um, if you add a sticky note here from the from the left hand toolbar, I drop that in, and now it's in the cloud. And all of the collaborators, so just like Google Docs, you can have multiple people in it at one time. They all see that happen as well too. So when you think about remote design and the visual challenges that you have, um, I think tools like Envision are great. Slack obviously um, is, has really been a game changer. Um, Envision is great for prototyping, and I think Mural kind of complements those as well too, with a, a virtual whiteboard that you can you can draw on and add sticky notes to, and screenshots and things like that as well too. Uh, and you know, uh, we were we were able to in this example session that I showed, we were able to get through a service blueprinting um, exercise with folks in the Philippines and not using a sticky note. <clears throat> There's the example. Um, so if you want to learn more, you can go to mural.co. We have a free trial for 30 days. Um, but um, you also find on uh, practicalservicedesign.com, I don't know if anybody's mentioned that resource here, um, but Eric uh, Flowers, who was pictured there in that picture that I had, uh, runs this website. And he's got a nice little demo of uh, how to use Mural for service, uh, service design. But he's got some great resources there, a whole community of service designers as well, too, over there. So that's just a little shout out to Eric's group, um, practicalservicedesign.com, if anybody's interested in service design. Um, so you know, I started, I started the presentation talking about hired, hired hands, and then talked about knowledge workers, you know, working with your brain. Um, but this was a really interesting article that I happened to come across. There's nothing particularly special about this article, but um, some of the thoughts in here are really, really interesting. And he's talking about a shift, another shift, from the knowledge economy to what he calls the human economy. So if we work from you know, manual labor to kind of you know, knowledge workers, he's saying we're moving from knowledge workers to what he calls the human economy. Um, and basically, the human economy, he talks about passion. He talks about um, you know, uh, human qualities of collaboration. And then he writes, um, in the human economy, the most valuable workers will be hired hearts. So if we were, you know, 150 years ago, hired hands, manual labor, and then working with information. Now he's talking about the, the future is going to be about passion and, and whether you have a common vision and things like that. And I bring that up because I think, you know, I think when you talk about remote work, people complain about the technology. And I know, I've, I know all the problems of technology, and we've experienced them here in this call here today. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? And you waste time doing that. I get that. Um, but I actually think that for, for remote collaboration to work, for remote design to really work so that we do have the benefits of sustainability, I think it's, I think it's about teamwork. I think it's about passion. Um, I think it's about um, you know, be, being together, being on the same page as a team. That goes a long way. If your heart's in it, you can do a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to end the presentation there. I just want to give one plug, though. Uh, we're doing a workshop on remote design thinking on March 7th. On March 7th, we're giving a free workshop. It's limited to 24 people who are going to be se selected, um, but we're going to teach some sp sp um, design thinking methods, specifically how do you do these remote. Um, and there are the times. It's 9 Pacific, uh, 12 noon Eastern time, or 5 p.m. in Great Britain. That would be 6 p.m. in Europe. And you can sign up. Uh, again, we're going to select folks, so you have to sign up first, and then we're going to get 24 folks to do this. It's free right now. Um, it's mur.al slash remote DT, remote design thinking, remote DT. You can sign up there. I'll, I'll send this link around as well, too. Um, so, so thanks a lot. That's, uh, that was my presentation. Um, the survey that I mentioned before was bit.ly slash remote collaboration. You can check out Mural and Practical Service Design as well, too. And then that uh, workshop that I was uh, just pointing to, uh, Remote DT. It's mur.al slash remote DT. I've made all of these slides available on the Mural um, SlideShare site. And then I can, I can chuck these, uh, these links here. I'll, I'll try to put them over in the Slack after this presentation is done. So uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>